The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas Mueller. I'm the product manager for the ASM business at Brooker. I'd like to welcome you to this installment of our Brooker ASM webinar series. The presentation today is titled, Measuring Absolute Values of Modulus of Elasticity for Soft Materials with ASM. It will be presented by Dr. B. Pittenger of Brooker ASM and Professor Igor Sokolov of Clarkson University. Before I introduce B. and Igor, I'd like to make a few quick logistical comments. First, we encourage your participation during the webinar, and if you have a question, please type it into the questions dialog box on your screen. We'll accumulate the questions uh, through the presentation and uh, try to group them, and we'll answer them at the end of the prepared remarks. Quite often, we have more questions than we can answer. In those cases, we'll follow up with email. Also, if you'd like to review the presentation afterwards or pass it on to a colleague, the webinar will be posted online later today. Uh, in the webinar section, it will be posted in the webinar section of the Brooker webpage. As a follow-up to the presentation, you'll also be receiving an email with that link. Uh, finally, when you exit the webinar today, you'll be asked to take a brief survey. We'd very much appreciate if you do take the time to complete that survey, as it helps us pick the topics and just generally make this series better. So let's get started. Let me introduce our presenters. Dr. B. Pittenger is a senior development scientist in the ASM unit of uh, Brooker's nanosurfaces business. He received his PhD in physics from the University of Washington, Seattle in 2000, but he's worked with scanning probe microscopes for more than 20 years, building systems, developing techniques, and uh, studying properties of materials at the nanoscale. His work has spanned the topics from studies of interfacial melting of ice to material property mapping of polymers. Dr. Pittenger has over a dozen publications and patents on various techniques and applications of scanning probe microscopy. He will be presenting jointly today with his collaborator, Dr. Igor Sokolov, who is a professor of physics and director of the Nanoengineering and Biotechnology Laboratory Center at Clarkson University. Dr. Sokolov received his PhD in physics from the Russian Bureau of Standards in 1991. He has worked with AFM for 24 years studying properties of materials, including organic and inorganic surfaces at the highest possible resolution. Additionally, Professor Sokolov has used the AFM as a nanostethoscope to study physiology of insects. He studied distribution of electrical charges on non-conductive surfaces of bacteria and quantum dots, and has investigated forces between surfaces and single nanoparticles attached to the AFM probe. In the last eight years, he has studied um, mechanics of soft materials with AFM, including biological cells, molecular layers, and polymers. Dr. Sokolov has more than 130 referee papers, and 29 patents are assigned and pending, including in the area of AFM. So let me now turn it over to Bede for the first part of the talk titled, Measuring Absolute Values of Modulus of Elasticity for Soft Materials with AFM. Thanks for the introduction, Thomas. I'm Bede Pittenger, and I'll be starting this joint webinar with a recent review, or a review of recent developments in peak force Q&M and force volume uh, applied to mechanical property mapping. Let's begin with a review of some basic modes of AFM operation. Contact mode AFM was developed in the mid-'80s. The Z position of the uh, piezo was adjusted to keep the cantilever deflection uh, constant while scanning. The downside of this is that because your tip is always in contact with the surface, um, the, the lateral force on the tip is uncontrolled, and this could lead to dip and sample damage. In 92, uh, tapping mode um, made this, uh, this technique more gentle um, by instead of feeding back on the uh, deflection of the cantilever, um, the, uh, um, the feedback was on the amplitude of the cantilever vibration uh, near, the, near the resonance. Because the cantilever was vibrating um, and uh, going between um, uh, contact and non-contact every cycle of the vibration, um, this eliminated the lateral force on the, on the tip. About the same time, um, researchers uh, were looking to expand beyond topographic imaging and use the AFM probe to learn more about the properties of their samples at the nanoscale. They already knew that they could use force curves to study the sample 
by ramping the deposition at one location and looking at the cantilever deflection while they did this. They realized that they could collect these force curves at every pixel in the image, combining the Z motion of the ramping and the XY motion of the scanning um, to uh, um, create a, a map of the tip sample forces um, while keeping the lateral force to a minimum. Unfortunately, this technique is relatively slow and uh, makes images uh, with a lot of pixels um, uh, pretty impractical because it, it takes so long to collect them. In 2009, we developed uh, peak force tapping to allow the benefits of forest volume with much higher ramp rates and uh, much higher resolution, um, allowing higher scan rates. In peak force tapping, um, there is a, um, we use, instead of using a, a linear Z-ramp, we use a sinusoidal Z-ramp. And um, we actually feed back at the very top of the, um, of the motion here. So we have the V-motion of the piezo, a sinusoid, and here's our deflection that's um, being examined by the system um, in real time. And uh, it detects the, the maximum force and uh, um, adjusts the piezo to keep this constant. Um, the tip is, is intermittently tapping the sample at around one kilohertz, which allows uh, eliminates one to two kilohertz, you know, allowing the sample to um, or the lateral forces to be um, eliminated. And um, this technique is is really good for uh, very soft samples and working with low forces because um, it, the tip is not in contact and um, we have excellent control over the peak force. Um, Key features of this technique are that the uh, the ramping is not linear, unlike force volume. Um, so we're using sinusoidal ramping, and the tip velocity is going to approach um, zero as the the tip uh, nears the sample so surface, which helps with the uh, the feedback. Also, um, the uh, the feedback is uh, is feeding back directly on the force. Um, so, um, and it, it actually benefits, the feedback uh, benefits from the results from prior force curves because a lot of times um, adjacent curves are very similar. So um, that helps the feedback loop work better. And um, we can, uh, this enables us to have really uh, fast ramping which gives us faster images even uh, when we add a lot more uh, pixels in the images. Um, so the result is we ha we're ending up with much better force control, faster speed, higher resolution, and um, excellent stability also. Force volume, on the other hand, uses a linear um, Z-ramp. Um, and uh, so the force curve looks more like this, where it's more linear um, going up to the peak force. Um, instead of using a feedback um, loop like uh, tapping mode and contact mode, uh, force volume discreetly triggers each each ramp, so it's watching the deflection during the cycle, and it actually is um, watching to see when the force exceeds some value, and then it um, tries to turn around all of a sudden at that point. Um, that's great as long as you go with relatively slow ramps, but we'll talk about why that doesn't work as well with faster ramps. Um, slower uh, ramps are kind of in the order of uh, around 10 hertz. Um, so 0 0.01 kilohertz. So it's quite a lot slower than um, peak force tapping. And um, the uh, uh, how good the force control is is, is really dependent on the um, ramp speed. And uh, the reason for that is that um, basically with this linear ramping, the tip um, it goes down and it hits the sample at its maximum or at, at the full velocity of the ramp, the constant velocity here. And um, the system tries to turn around um, at high speed, which um, leads to, uh, uh, can lead to ringing or hysteresis in the, um, in the piezo response. Um, now that, that usually doesn't happen at, uh, at low ramp rates, um, but once you exceed about uh, 10 hertz or so, um, you will start to see this, um, especially for larger ramp sizes where your velocity is higher. Um, secondly, the, uh, this triggered um, uh, feedback type, um, instead of using the the feedback that we use in peak force QNM, it is um, ignoring any information from previous ramps. So basically, it uh, uh, is trying to turn around at that um, 
that trigger point, and um, it really can't um, turn around immediately. So there's a tendency to overshoot the, um, the target force, um, causing some error in the actual feedback, and um, basically making the uh, um, potentially damaging the tip or the sample, but just having uh, worse control over the over force compared to the peak force tapping. So again, these are um, mainly issues with um, with uh, high speed um, force volume, and if, as long as you stay at lower speeds, you're fine. Um, but um, basically, it results in three options. One is um, we can go fast and we can get to a relatively high resolution, but we have if we do that, we have poor, poor force control um, and poor Z accuracy because we're ramping at a higher rate. Or uh, secondly, um, we have good con uh, force control and high resolution, but it takes forever. Um, and uh, or the final thing is that uh, we go um, fairly fast for you know we collect an image in a reasonable amount of time, um, and we have good control, but um, we don't have high resolution. Um, so. Uh, we have those options with force volume, and um, definitely force volume is a useful technique, but uh, it's just that uh, peak force is much better if you're trying to get high resolution uh, images in a reasonable amount of time. So um, one example, this is an example of um, where you might like to have um, high resolution and quantitative um, material property. Um, this is actually a polymer composite. Um, it's a heat sealed um, uh, bag. And there's um, three layers. So there's a, a barrier layer which keeps the uh, um, the uh, moisture and um, uh, atmosphere constant inside your food bag. Um, there's a tie layer which holds the uh, the two other layers together. And then um, there's a sealant layer which actually melts um, and adheres to itself when heated. So the, the bag is folded over and heated, and this uh, bonds to itself. So what we can do is that we can examine um, the two different interfaces here, um, this one and in the next slide we'll look at this one. And you can look at it with a, a modulus map. So this is actually not an image of topography, which is um, what you would normally see with AFM. This is actually a map of the modulus of the material at high resolution. And you can clearly see the boundary of where the nylon um, is and, the, and where the uh, ULDPE is. Um, you can also see that there's um, epitaxial um, uh, lamella growing off the uh, um, the nylon into the ULDP e, um, uh, which uh, is basically about the length of uh, about 250 nanometers uh, long. These lamella are quite small; they're on the order of um, 10 nanometers across, and uh, so. Uh, We've got a lot of detail here. You can you can actually look quantitatively at the uh, how much what the modulus is in this region and what the modulus is over here. Just detecting um, this is um, not trivial if you have a very good microtome of the of the sample because the step is not uh, that distinct. But um, uh, with the modulus, it's extremely clear. So. Um, so basically, you can study things about uh, how compatible um, the uh, these different materials are, um, and uh, you can look at the length scale of the interface between the two different materials, um, and uh, you can see that essentially the uh, modulus is changing um, over a, a range of around 75 nanometers. Um, but then this uh, ordered area here of these lamella actually results in another secondary drop, which um, can extend up to 250 nanometers into the tie layer. So at the other um, boundary, um, we have uh, um, more compatible um, uh, components. And um, so you can actually see that the lamella grow um, from one into another, into the other um, domain. And uh, that causes the, the variation in modulus to be much more gradual. Although if you look over a single scan line um, here, you still see that there's um, the variation is more really dominated by the variation in the lamella. So this uh, um, variation in modulus that um, is so important for the um, properties of this bag is really because of the collective um, uh, modulus of all these, um, these lamella. 
So um, Peak Force Q&M um, works by basically examining the, uh, um, excuse me, uh, all of the data that's collected um, during each of these cycles. And um, so instead of, um, like in general, peak force having, we're only looking at this um, the peak force to do the feedback. But um, the Q&M part actually has access to the whole um, force curve. So we can calculate out um, a bunch of different properties of this curve very easily. Uh, we can look at the peak force. We can look at the adhesion. We can look at the modulus by using some kind of a fit on this um, contact part of the curve. We can look at um, the deformation of the sample, which is the distance between the first contact and, and the, um, the deformation at the maximum force. We can also look at the dissipation, which is um, often dominated by the work of adhesion here, where we have a big uh, pull-off. So um, I'd like to now um, talk about some new features that are um, basically have just been released for um, QNM. Basically, um, uh, we're calling it our new nanomechanics package. And, and um, basically, we have expanded um, peak force QNM capabilities that are especially uh, made for soft samples. Um, so we can work with uh, force curves at larger amplitudes uh, and lower frequencies. We also have the addition of the Snedden, Conical, and Denner model. Um, we have the ability to capture um, uh, curves at every pixel um, in this peak force capture um, feature. We have a, um, a quantitative force volume mapping uh, mode, a new analysis tools, and then we have a new uh, suite of force um, curve analysis tools. And those are all available, um, uh, excuse me, the offline cur curves are available to everyone um, at no charge. Just download this. Um, uh, latest version of nanoscope analysis. Um, users of Dimension, FastScan, and Icon, the Bioscope Catalyst, and the Multimode 8 can obtain um, the real-time part as well um, by getting a free upgrade to the latest version of nanoscope, which is now uh, version 815R3. Uh, all of this is available on Nanoscale uh, World, SPM Digest. Um, you can follow this link if you um, but if you just remember Nanoscale World, go, go search Google for that. You'll, you'll find it very quickly. So um, I mentioned that um, we now have the Snedden model. Um, the, uh, the Snedden model is useful in cases where you have soft samples where the tip actually indents um, well beyond this, uh, um, the, part, the end of the tip, where it's um, at the very end, the tip may be um, modeled by a sphere. But uh, if you're pushing into a, a, a bacterium or something like that, um, you're likely to go much farther than this. And you have to um, consider the, 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 uh, um, the sidewalls of the tip. And um, so we've implemented this Snedden model. Um, and it, it seems to, it's also um, essentially what the community, the bio um, AFM community, is, is using primarily to look at uh, um, cells. So, um, uh, we're, we're kind of um, following in the footsteps of the researchers here, but, uh, um, but basically uh, makes it much easier if you're working with a, um, a much bigger deformation. Um, also, if you're um, working with a larger, um, with, a, with very soft samples, you may need to use a larger force curve because um, the uh, force doesn't increase that rapidly. Um, and uh, the, so now um, we have the ability to support ramp sizes up to four microns on the catalyst. Um, and uh, in, in some cases, you may want to also work with lower um, modulation frequencies, um, especially when you're working with these very large ramp sizes, you may have to. So um, we have the ability to, uh, to drop down and see some different frequencies. Um, and these also help you uh, if you're trying to do time-dependent studies where you want to do comparisons with uh, force volume because you can get down into that re regime where you're, you're closer to the force volume um, modulation rates. So um, here's a couple of examples of um, looking at bacteria. Um, and basically, here we have a, a 3D topography of um, two bacteria. Um, this is E. coli um, measured in fluid using a, a, a 300 nanometer modulation amplitude. and um, 
This is um, ramping at 250 hertz. Um, we use the Snedden model um, to uh, analyze the, the modulus. Um, and you can clearly see that the mod this uh, um, cell here is um, significantly softer um, than this one. Uh, we're not sure if that's because of um, it dividing and it's being that part of its life cycle or, or exactly what, but there's, um, there's a big difference in terms of the modulus. It's almost an order of magnitude difference in, in terms of modulus, like about two, two megapascals versus around 15. The substrate is actually not um, giving us um, an accurate modulus number because it is a little too stiff for this probe and, and configuration, but the rest of the um, cells seem like they're in, the, in a reasonable um, range. Um, we also um, tried some really soft samples. These are um, basically agarose gels, uh, and we have, um, so we've gone all the way down to about 65 kilopascals with this, um, and uh, we have three different gels here looking at different modulus um, numbers in up from 65 kilopascals up to about one megapascal. This is with a, a pretty soft probe, um, an LCTE probe. So, um, and these are all measured um, in peak force Q and M. But, um, uh, and we're also able to, um, during these images, um, previously we were not able to get uh, a force curve at every uh, pixel in the image. Um, however, we can now, um, excuse me, we, we couldn't capture it. We, we were always um, uh, doing the force curves and, um, and basically uh, measuring them, but the analysis was done in real time and we didn't have access to the raw data afterward. Um, so now we, we have um, the ability to save all that data. Um, however, we, um, we also get the regular QNM image, which is calculated in real time, um, and we get a force um, volume file. Um, this peak force capture uses the, uh, the quantitative force volume file format, which is um, basically compatible with uh, our older force volume um, uh, data. Um, so you can use the, the full um, quantitative force volume analysis tool pack that um, we'll talk about in a minute um, for force volume. Uh, and we can analyze these peak force capture files with the same tool. You can also um, import the, these data files into um, uh, external um, software packages if you, if you have something that can analyze the uh, force volume files from down step. So here's, some, here's an example offline looking at the, um, some force volume, um, peak force uh, capture data. This is the, the same um, two bacterium. And you can see here that um, uh, we have all of the curves. We can actually click anywhere on this image and get um, and see what the curves are. Here's two of them. I, Green is from that point, and red is from this point. And um, so this gives us um, some opportunities. Um, for one thing, we can uh, directly test the, the model. Uh, we can look at different models. Um, and we can also export these curves. So if you wanted to do, use something totally different um, that we don't support, um, you, can, you can do that. Um, you can also um, adjust the calibration parameters after the, the data has been captured. So if you find out afterward that your deflection sensitivity or your spring constant or some chip radius or whatever was wrong, you can do that. Um, and this also makes it much easier to do comparisons between peak force QNM and other um, techniques such as force volume. So you can look at uh, um, time dependence of the tip sample interaction. So here's the, uh, let's talk about the uh, new quantitative force volume technique. So this is the, the real-time force volume, just like what we used, have done for, for 15 years, essentially. Um, basically, this is a reference technique to allow us to compare um, QNM, but it also allows very low ramp rates, so you can go down to even less than one hertz if you want to do comparison to non-AFM uh, material property measurement technique, techniques, such as DMA. And uh, as I mentioned, we have this new uh, real-time and offline um, analysis capabilities to give us the modulus and adhesion maps um, from force volume. It used to be we only had the slice um, in uh, our offline uh, force volume data. So we, um, we've added a lot of functionality there. Um, and we use exactly the same models as the peak force QNM, so you can um, more easily do these comparisons. Um, so here's some... Um, uh, 
system, forest curves collected at different rates, 20 hertz, 10 hertz, 2 hertz. Um, and then these are modulus maps of the, uh, the forest volume data. And they all have the same data scale. Um, so you can see that uh, the, uh, the color is about the same uh, brightness on these, all these cells. So really, it's not changing that much in terms of um, the modulus measurement. However, the background is a little bit um, brighter on the, the slower one. That's probably because there's better accuracy on the, uh, on the ramp, and um, really that probe is not quite good enough to, to measure this, um, uh, to measure this uh, really stiff material. So um, here's the, um, going back to the agarose gels, um, looking at um, force volume versus Q&M. Um, and uh, you can see that there's actually really good agreement between the force volume and the QNM. There is a little bit of a difference at the 5% um, uh, level, but um, this data was collected in um, uh, about 11 minutes for um, 16,000 points for QNM, uh, four um, minutes for 200, only 256 points for uh, force volume. So it just gives you much better statistics. So let's talk for a second about the uh, um, uh, force curve analysis functionality here. Um, we have um, a bunch of new uh, functions just to deal with individual force curves. We can modify parameters. We can do a baseline correction. We can do a box uh, car filter. We can also do um, our indentation analysis. This is the workhorse, which allows us to do the fitting. And all of this can be batch um, done through batch processing. And then we also have this MATLAB toolbox, which is a very uh, exciting new uh, thing that we've never had in the past. Should save people a lot of time. So let's see, let's just demonstrate a couple of these functions. Here's the um, adjusting the spring constant. So if I wanted to change my spring constant, I just type numbers in here, hit execute. Now I'm using that spring constant, and now I want to do a baseline correction. So the system can automatically pick out the part of the curve. Uh, which is going to use for the baseline, and um, when I hit execute, it gets flattened out. Then I can basically do a boxcar filter to remove a little bit of this noise, although this isn't a very noisy curve in the first place, but um, we can do that. And then uh, here's our, our fitting. Right now we're using the linearized model um, Hertzian, and we are looking at including the adhesion force, which is marked by this blue line basically automatically detecting this point, and um, we can adjust the part of the curve we'd like to have fit, and we get out the uh, Young's modulus, uh, reduced modulus, and our squared. Um, and you can also see how good the fit is. And again, um, these all work with the run history function, so you can automate them, and you can do a 1,000 curves if you want to. Um, and it basically just takes the time to, for the system to do the computation. Now I mentioned that uh, we also have this new MATLAB um, toolbox. Um, basically, the way this works is there's a DLL that's in your um, Nanoscope data um, uh, directory, Nanoscope Analysis data, or Nanoscope Analysis directory, and um, MATLAB can call the DLL directly, and um, then you can open up uh, Nanoscope data files very easily. So you don't have to worry so much about um, about changes to our file format. Um, and uh, managing the file parsing part of, of programming in MATLAB if you want to deal with that. So you don't need to do um, ASCII export, and you can do better uh, automation. And really, this just frees the researchers from focusing on um, the, this parsing of the header to uh, modeling and results. So this is basically, these are the key parts of the, the program. This basically opens up the communication to the DLL. It opens the file. It gets the data needed to do the fourth plot. Maybe you get a couple of thing, other things out of the header, like the Poisson's ratio or the tip radius, and then you close it. And um, then it becomes very easy to do like a comparison between a sudden and a, um, a DMT fit, for example. So um, basically, uh, we, we talked about um, mainly about uh, Q&M and, and force volume. Um, there's also single force curves, which are just the, the non-mapping version of the, um, the Q&M, and um, so uh, 
QNM is the best for the high speed, high resolution uh, measurements. Basically, uh, sports volume is great for comparisons to QNM and for special cases where loading rate dependence is important, um, such as viscoelastic measurements, kinetic binding or unfolding measurements, that sort of thing. And single force curves are for situations where mapping is not as important. Um, and basically, uh, there's only uh, a few p points of interest on the sample or where force measurements need to be separated by some distance to avoid um, crosstalk between the, um, the measurements. The new nanomechanics um, package adds the functionality to allow users to um, easily bridge between the techniques of peak force, force volume and uh, single force curves. Um, by adding these uh, real-time um, calculation of, of Snedden modulus, et cetera, et cetera, um, for, to these uh, techniques. And also allowing the access through offline um, so that we can recalculate with different models and with different parameters and inspect curves anywhere on the image. And finally, the, uh, the force volume um, tools, or the force curve tools, uh, allow us to correct um, force curves, analyze, um, and inspect the model fitting and automate all that um, with a lot more flexibility. So um, this all allows um, easy comparison between the techniques to allow us to test different models and explore time dependence of tip sample interaction, um, either at a single point or in a map of a sample surface. Um, we are uh, pretty excited here at Bruker to see what uh, you all are going to do with these new capabilities. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and um, uh, I can now take some questions if we have time. So the, uh, um, in terms of the one question was the, the heat sealed uh, bag sample, was that image taken in ambient or controlled conditions? Um, that sample was taken in ambient conditions, um, and uh, I have a collaborator um, that uh, was able to provide that uh, actually already microtoned, but only a, a day or so before. Um, and the microtomy was excellent, some of the best I've ever seen, so uh, really great uh, sample. Um, okay, so. Um, on the agarose gels using the softer um, pro, what was the average deformation? Um, I will have to get back to you on that one, David. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, I don't have that at the tips of my fingers right now, but I'm, I'm guessing that, I mean, most of these had deformations that were um, over 50 nanometers, um, probably, um, but, but I'll need to double check on the exact numbers for that. Um, and um, there is uh, quite some periodic noise in the baseline of the curve. So um, a lot of times what happens is that uh, when we're, we're sampling with um, a high sample rate, like we do in QNM and um, you could do in fourth, um, regular force curves also, that what happens is when you um, pull off the sample, um, there is some uh, ringing of the uh, um, the cantilever as it uh, breaks free of the, the, um, the sample. It's like plucking a guitar string or something like that. And um, basically, uh, um, that depends on how much adhesion there is and how abrupt the, uh, the pull-off is. But um, it's usually, it usually damps down um, prior to um, the next contact. Um, What kind of tip does QNM require, and what type of calibration? So um, the uh, um, the tip depends on the sample. So you need to um, essentially uh, choose a, a probe that um, makes sense for your sample. And um, so if you're using a softer sample like these um, gels, then you want to use a very soft probe. Um, if you're using a stiffer sample, um, uh, like into the gigapascal range, then you need to use a, a, a stiff probe, and, and we've had people even using like nano indenting probes, so it really varies a lot. Um, these uh, the softer samples were scanned with um, softer probes, uh, such as the um, the SNL A um, probe, um, 
and the uh, scan assist fluid probe and um, some of the MLCT probes, which are um, quite a bit softer even than those. Um, I wonder if conical probes could perforate soft samples like cells. Um, uh, I mean, uh, certainly they can if they, uh, um, the, the probe um, is, the cantilever is too stiff and the, the force is too high and the, uh, um, the half angle is um, uh, too steep. So um, one thing that you can do is you can use um, either a probe that is, has a, uh, a more rounded, like a parabolic end shape, um, or a, a, a less um, sharp pyramid. Um, there are um, probes out there that have um, uh, ha uh, bigger half angles, um, which allow you to do that. And um, but yeah, it's a combination of the um, the probe shape, um, the tip shape, and the reverse Okay, so I guess we should uh, uh, move on to the next speaker, um, Igor uh, uh, Sokolov. I, um, I can see his uh, cover slide is, is up right now, and it uh, looks like he's presenting now. Um, so thank you, and uh, we will um, remain on the line, and uh, we'll also answer the, the additional questions that I didn't get to later through email. So thanks. Okay, so can you hear me? Yep. Hello. Uh -huh. We can hear you. Uh -huh. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and do you hear? Do you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we see. Oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> and sorry for this. It's just really like hard for me to to speak to the audience without seeing you guys. Uh, so I'll. Um, briefly speak about uh, the absolute values. Uh, when you get the numbers, um, can you really trust those numbers? And this is really very non-trivial question. So um, first, I would really like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Maxim de Kukin, who is instrumental in what I'm going to present. He is the guy here. Like. And this uh, research was supported by NSF at this point. So um, here we test how quantitative AFM is on measuring the elastic modulus at the nanoscale. Uh, because we will deal with mostly homogeneous materials, or we assume that it's homogeneous. So uh, elastic modulus, it means uh, the Young's modulus. So that's synonymous in this case. Um, so. Uh, the results I announced uh, right now, pretty much, uh, the answer is yes. AFM can be quantitative, but one has to be accurate in using uh, the appropriate model and uh, probes. So the idea how we do these tests, to take homogeneous polymer and measure its elastic modulus, or the Young's modulus, as I said, using uh, the existing methods, microDMA, nanoinventor, and then compare this with uh, two different modes, or maybe not very different, but uh, AFM force volume and peak force QNM. So of course we have the assumption that macro and nanoscale moduli should be close to each other. So we speak about homogeneous material down to the nanoscale and no surface effect. What I mean that uh, deterioration of the surface, aging of the surface, or some surface reconstruction. This can be tested by comparison fresh cleavage of the sample uh, and uh, just to do the same like uh, in a few days and weeks and so on and see if you have any aging effect. So, uh, and of course, as a note, ramping speed in all these techniques uh, was kept about the same. Otherwise, like uh, the definitely risk elastic uh, response can step in and uh, smear your results. So we'll use uh, two polymers here as our standards in some sense. So polyurethane and poly, uh, polystyrene. So uh, micron scale modulus. Uh, well, it's not nanodendron, it's <laughs> like nanodma, so macro DMA. So it's a macro machine. It works either uh, in bending and where a sample is like a, some sort of a plate and you can push it with a single cantilever uh, setup or double cantilever setup. 
or you can put your sample in between two plates and or plate in a sphere and do a compression analysis. And uh, you have uh, just a sec, it's just my computer by some reason goes on strike. It's interesting. Okay, so <laughs> while I was actually thinking what to do next, uh, this technique allows you to study not only uh, the modulus in itself, but it allows you to do uh, analysis of linearity, linearity between stress and strain. Uh, what it means, yeah, that's better. Uh, what it means is that you can uh, measure stress and strain. By the way, uh, sorry, do you, do you hear my slides now? Indeed. Yes, we, we can see the slides. Okay. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, so uh, what you can see here uh, that you measure stress and strain in these cases. And in the beginning, it's linear. Uh, here on the right, you see, uh, see the zoom of that, very small stresses and uh, strains. And you can see pretty straight uh, lines for both polyurethane and polystyrene, like several lines or simply several samples. And if you uh, do a large scale, you can see that it's pretty much linear to some region where you have uh, really, you reach the limit of linearity. And it's approximately for, uh, for polyurethane, it's about like uh, 60 megapascals and uh, approximately 130 for polystyrene. Of course, you can even see like a deviation from linearity before, but this is really kind of a, a number to deal with, just a rough number. So, and uh, if you work in the initial uh, part, so that's what we have. For polystyrene, we have approximately 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.65 gigapascals. Sorry, for polyurethane and for polystyrene, uh, 2.7 approximately. Contact diameter here is like about five millimeters. Uh, there is no depth analysis here. So, uh, then in dendro, it's next uh, level. It's already uh, what we found. It's really not nano, but it's a micron size contact you develop. So you simply have a needle, a uh, well-defined uh, geometry to push down your sample, and you have typically either spherical indenter or so-called Berkovich indenter we have uh, it's a triangular pyramid. So this is uh, the result. So it's a little busy slide. Uh, so you have a Berkovich indenter in the beginning, uh, of like here, showing you uh, the Young's modulus in gigapascals for uh, polystyrene and for polyurethane as a function of indentation. That's that's an indentation at the bottom. So uh, what do you see here that the modulus actually changes with uh, indentation depth. So uh, the same is uh, true of polyurethane, but you don't see it clear because it's just simply a small scale. Uh, you also have uh, calculated stress for each of these uh, points. And you can see that, uh, well, this stress is pretty large. If you compare it to the linearity limits, uh, so we can see that for polystyrene, uh, for example, we work above the linearity limit. For polyurethane, we can actually reach the linearity limit for uh, larger indentation. By the way, it's kind of uh, counterintuitive. You push harder and you get a smaller stress. But it's simply because this is pretty dull probe uh, and it's, it has a very big angle. So. Uh, if you push harder, you develop much bigger area of contact, and that, that's how a stress that goes down. If you use spherical indenter, so you have a pretty much like expected. Uh, the more pressure, the more force, the higher stress. So that's what you see. And uh, for polystyrene, in this case, you have increasing the modulus, and for polyurethane, also increasing and then saturates. So. In this case, uh, for spherical indenter, for example, you have a uh, well linear regime. And the bottom is simply like uh, showing you area of contact or diameter of contact versus indentation. So uh, you can see that, uh, for example, the, uh, when you reach linearity for polyurethane, it would correspond to the area of contact about like uh, 
seven microns diameter, and about 15 microns. Uh, that's what we can see for polyurethane. For polystyrene, we don't reach that at all. That's the result. So we uh, have uh, this, um, well, pretty much the data. And for, uh, for the polystyrene, we didn't reach any plateau or linear regime. So we just kind of only uh, put inequality. And these are the depth of penetration and the contact diameter. Now force microscope. Uh, first, you have to uh, deal with a uh, well-defined probe. Stresses should be also below the limit of linearity. Stresses can be numerically evaluated, and so you can see distribution. So we're speaking about the maximum stress right below the probe. That's where the stress is maximum. So the probe can be, a uh, geometry of the probe can be checked with so-called tip check scanning method. We have a special sample. You uh, scan that sample, and an algorithm recovers you uh, the probe uh, shape. Or you can, of course, use oops, you can use uh, electron microscope, but it's kind of uh, lesser quantitative. Uh, tip check gives you kind of really a better thing. Another thing, it's uh, a lot of people, especially from non-alimentation uh, area, uh, say bad words about AFM because you really have uh, some kind of a parasitic mo uh, motion of the probe when you push too hard. But fortunately, it's not really that big deal because uh, if you uh, start kind of seeing this effect, it's very clear in the calibration sensitivity plot. So you'll see that your response is not linear anymore, but keep bending. So you have to really work below that limit. This may be about usually like, it depends, of course, on the length of the cantilever, but it's like 100 nanometers, uh, 200 nanometers is usually OK. So and if you do the same what we did before, kind of it's again like uh, microscopic module I put here. Linearity limits are here. So you can see that. It's kind of funny because you have OK for uh, linearity for dull probe. In this case, it's like 800 nanometers. I mean, it's, and 200, uh, sorry, 22 nanometers. That's a regular probe, uh, commercial probe, sharp probe. So uh, we can reach linearity limit with this commercial probe with uh, deeper indentation. Or we are OK pretty much for all indentations, almost all indentation with this uh, dull probe. But we still have very strong dependence on indentation. And we can reach the bulk moduli only uh, starting from some kind of deeper indentation. But in one case, we even, uh, I mean, we're simply missing it. So the question was, uh, what was the problem? And the problem, yeah, and the resolution here is about like 100 nanometers. Uh, the uh, diameter of the contact in both cases. So that's what, what we kind of see the numbers. And you can look at this later. And uh, because of time is uh, running up. So I just uh, go next. What is the right way? Actually, the right way was adhesion, the key word. We have to take into account adhesion. And then we have two models. Actually, we have three. But uh, to make it simple, uh, it's either DMT model or JKR model. And if you uh, take into account the adhesion, uh, so you can see that in both cases, we don't have any dependence on the indentation depth. The modulus is pretty much like constant, which, by the way, it's a must. If you see indentation dependence, well, and you use a regular model, like Hertz model or Snedden model, it pretty much tells you that uh, you are on the wrong assumption, because those models are built based on the assumption of constancy of the uh, modulus. Modulus should be constant, independent of indentation. So in DMT, you see that we are actually pretty far from uh, the microscopic modulus for uh, polystyrene. We are OK for polyurethane. And for JKR, we are OK with uh, uh, polystyrene and just a little bit above for uh, polyurethane. And we are OK with linearity limits. And again, like we don't have any strong uh, or any skin, we call the skin effect, like dependence on the indentation depth. So now, um, what model to use? 
Fortunately, there is a parameter, which is called Malgus parameter, which can be calculated. And uh, I simply refer you to more detail to this reference. And uh, in both cases, for both polymers, uh, this uh, uh, parameter turned out to be more than 0 0.9. And if it's close to 1, so it means you have to use JKR model. That's what we did. So JKR. So this is uh, the summary table telling you that if you use JKR model, these are the numbers. We have very good agreement with polystyrene uh, on macro module, macro scale modules. We have a, a reasonably good agreement with polyurethane. And uh, so we can see these modules, bulk modules, starting from approximately 2 nanometer indentation depth. So which pretty much like close to squeezing all these uh, nano asperities because of intrinsic roughness of the material. So the area of contact, or diameter, sorry, of contact is approximately 100 to 120 nanometers. Now, if you work with uh, peak force, all previous work done with uh, single force analysis, with force volume analysis. So, uh, of course, we are speaking about a little bit different numbers because uh, QNM, uh, it's a fast technique. Our version was like one kilohertz. Uh, and the other, actually, we had pretty long, uh, broad range of frequencies we can try with uh, this um, force volume. So you can see that uh, pretty much the numbers stay the same. It is uh, the well, to be precise, uh, yes, this is, uh, again, like uh, we are speaking about analysis of unloading part of the uh, force curve. And you see that for both polystyrene and for polyurethane, uh, peak force QNM gives a reasonable, reasonably close numbers with, uh, so it's much like uh, in the, uh, frequency independent. This is not, of course, uh, universal. There are a number of polymers which are frequency dependent in this range. But at least for this one, uh, the uh, dependence is low, weak. And as a result, we can compare QNAM and uh, peak force QNAM and uh, force volume modes. So this is an example of using uh, quantitative, how we call this, peak force QNAM, because these modules are, is really uh, what we are like uh, at least uh, close to the bulk modulus. For polyurethane and for polystyrene, these uh, pictures of height and elastic modulus show. And this is uh, the final summary table showing you that peak force QNM, if you use Dahl probe and JKR model, can give you these numbers, which are uh, pretty much identical to the force volume uh, if you use Dahl probe and uh, JKR. So, and for example, for polystyrene, we have a perfect agreement with the bulk modulus. And area of contact uh, approximately like 50 nanometers and uh, 3 nanometer uh, indentation depth is estimated. So now, uh, where we, is it really the limit of uh, spatial resolution? Because we use actually dull probe. So uh, this is uh, the formula which you can use to calculate the radius of the probe to work in linear regime. So for our materials, that was radius is at least uh, should be like 200, maybe 300 nanometers. It seems to be quite large. So and we see uh, elastic modulus starting from 2 to 3 nanometers vertical deformation, sorry, indentation, and about like 50 nanometers contact diameter. So can we do better? Pretty much. Uh, yeah, uh, because you see, uh, derivation of this formula is based on the classical macroscopic theory of elasticity extrapolated to the nanoscale. But materials at the nanoscale can withstand, as an example, much higher stresses without plastic deformation or destruction. This is what I ask uh, my students typically to, to, to do. Just calculate the stress during the contact mode imaging, and you will see that that stress is sufficient to destroy any macroscopic uh, sample. But it's still OK, and we don't have destruction. So thus, we need to continue studying the limits. Because uh, 
even linearity at the nanoscale uh, may be quite different, simply because we don't have uh, defects at the nanoscale, at least uh, like smeared uh, homogeneously over the bulk. So that's that's pretty much like what we are doing these days. So uh, this is the conclusion. So to obtain the elastic modulus at the nanoscale for soft material quantitatively, one needs use either a force volume or peak force QNM modes. Watch for the linearity and stress strain regime and uh, relation, and take into account adhesion. Of course, you can have some cases where adhesion is negligible. Then you're lucky. You can use pretty much any model. If not, so uh, then uh, you have to take this into account. And this is the picture, like if you use sharp probe and which like put you in nonlinear regime and uh, no taking into account adhesion, so you have this kind of uh, dependence. And if you take uh, adhesion into account and you use a dollar probe, so you work in linear regime, you have a perfect uh, match to the bulk of well, microscopic modulus. So thank you. If you have any questions, I think we still have time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, how should I see this? Uh, and probably so, uh, answer. I'll, I'll just read off a few of these uh, these questions that have come in, um, Igor, and then you can um, answer them if you'd like. Um, uh, <clears throat> You mentioned indentation dependence on the moduli meant something was wrong. Does this mean your samples were measured in the absolute mode? Uh, all measurements we have done, they measured in absolute mode. I mean, uh, as an example, I mean, you can uh, use so-called calibration methods where you take a sample with known, known, better say in quotation mark, of moduli and say, OK, my radius of the probe should be such and such. But this is a little bit putting dust on the carpet, because you simply kind of all uh, possible nonlinearity you transfer into this effective radius of the probe. So, uh, but it's not really a big deal. This uh, deep check sample, I mean, it's, it's really not expensive. And uh, the test uh, recover of the radius of the probe and geometry of the probe is a standard feature of many software. I think maybe you like uh, your native software can do that. Mm -hmm. So that does Okay, the um, how, how about this one? Um, how does uh, adhesion force affect the slope of the indentation? Uh, actually, it does not, because adhesion simply gives you a hysteresis when you go back. So as a result, uh, when you uh, have a contact Adhesion, it's a sticky force. It's kind of a force which uh, pulls your probe down, and it increases the area of contact. And it can do like in, uh, either DMT approach way or JCAR way. Uh, that, that's like two different models, and it depends on uh, pretty much how soft your material is and how strong adhesion is. Mm -hmm. So um, I, there's a question um, here, uh, which which I will answer. Um, the Snedden model provided in the Netoscope software, how does it compare with the JKR model? Um, the Snedden model uh, is actually uh, does not by itself include any, any adhesion. Um, it is um, um, it allows the calculation of the solution to the Hertz um, problem, which uh, has no adhesion. Um, for any um, any tip shape, the the model that we've provided in the Nanoscope software has been specifically calculated for the uh, the cone um, tip shape, but it does not include adhesion. Again, JKR model, on the other hand, is um, a model that is um, for the, a sphere with adhesion, um, uh, and that Moji's per parameter that uh, Igor mentioned allows the um, the uh, uh, user to decide whether um, DMT would be better um, or or JKR would be better uh, in terms of a way to represent the adhesion of a sphere um, to a flat surface. Um, so um, it's a, it's a bit different, um, but uh, that's, yeah, but that's I, what I have for answer. 
I probably can add that uh, you can implement this uh, Jakara model using this uh, MATLAB connection for, yeah. for offline okay. analysis nowadays. Okay, so I think uh, we probably should um, go ahead and wrap up. Uh, we're a little over, so, um, but uh, um, uh, I think Tom is supposed to say a couple more. words. You want to take uh, one more? I'm just like one, one short answer to, because I had this, like several questions about this. Uh, what about uh, biological cells and so on? And uh, that's where I have to really stress that uh, everything presented is okay for polymers. For really very soft materials, either long range force is important. When you approach your probe to the sample, you already can deform it before you reach contact. And this long range force for cells is very much pronounced because cells are surrounded by sort of like entropic brush. And uh, uh, taking that into account is uh, what we found is paramount for quantitative uh, analysis of those. But that, that's a little bit different uh, kind of further development of what is presented here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we'll probably do another, another webinar for that uh, in the future. Um, but, uh, um, okay, I think Thomas will uh, say a couple words here and, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. And we will um, be posting the, uh, um, oh yeah, um, maybe you're going to say this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Pete and uh, Igor. And yeah, thank you all for uh, attending. We have a lot more questions. We'll, we'll follow up with email as we said. Um, yeah, one of the questions was about availability of the presentation later. So yes, it will be posted. Um, uh, we'll have it on, on our webpage, um, the, the, the webinar, the presentation. Um, and uh, when, when you exit, uh, please do take the survey. It really helps us uh, choose future topics, make this series better. And uh, with that, um, thank you for attending. And we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.